From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back. Here we go again with another episode of the Cannabis Podcast. You must have a fascination with cannabis just like I do. So welcome back for another 30 minutes or so, exploring a whole bunch of things cannabis. If this is your first visit, well, an especially warm welcome for you. I hope you're going to enjoy the ride. Today, we are going to give some tips on smoking weed inside, which seems to be an issue, or at least it has been through the winter, and it will continue to be through the summer, I suppose. We have an interview with Leah Teal. She is the marketing director for Indiva, and we're going to talk about the new Wanna Quick Gummies today. Also, we'll look at how the high THC trend might be distorting our supply chain a little bit. We talk about the accuracy of labels on our cannabis, and we're going to stop on Cultivar Corner for some Greybeard Kish. Plus, we'll have a flashback to leaving a bag of pot in a movie theater. All of that and more on episode 69 of the Cannabis Podcast. It's funny how you get distracted in life, isn't it? <laughs> Here I was putting this episode together and pretty well finished everything in terms of what was going to be in this particular episode. Done the editing, done the finalization, everything's pretty well ready to go. And then I looked at the clock, and I realized that I was two days away from 4.20 and had not made any reference to 4.20. I think I was stoned or something. Well, surprisingly enough, as of this particular moment, I just woke up on this Sunday morning. I am not stoned at the moment. That will happen pretty soon. But I did want to recognize the fact that here we are. It's another 4.20 this year. And once again, there's going to be a, a bit of irony for my 4.20 because I'll be working. And throughout the part of my working day, there will be no cannabis consumed. As soon as I'm done, though, then we'll get busy and, and we'll make up for lost time. <laughs> so what are your 420 plans this year? I heard uh, Dana Larson announced that there was not going to be a big 420 celebration in Vancouver this year. He was trying to do some giveaways on Twitter and had his account suspended, which was pretty funny. Here in Kelowna, I don't think there's a whole lot happening from a, an official 420 celebration perspective. Although I'm sure a lot of people will be just gathering in their own little bubbles, smoking a couple of joints, and celebrating the fact that this weed is legal in our country. This is our third legal 420. It's the first 420 that we've actually had the store open, so we're doing lots of big things. It's going to be a fun day, but I will be working, and I won't be stoned until about 4.46 on 420. So whatever your plans are, make them safe. Let's observe some COVID protocols as well to keep us all safe after 420. Have a blast and get high for me. And we'll start off the episode today with the story about how THC obsession may just be distorting our cannabis supply chain. This is from stratcan.com for the cannabis community. The Canadian cannabis market puts an emphasis on THC levels with a heavy bias toward flour that's 20% THC or higher. As a result, many quality products are denied access to the supply chain and the consumer is being underserved. I think this is a direct result of not understanding the importance of the role the broker played in the illicit market, says Jamie Shaw, a director of the BC Independent Cannabis Association and an advisor to the National Institute for Cannabis Health and Legalization. Provinces that decided to become brokers typically tend to try and treat it like alcohol, so THC percentage as a marker makes sense to them. The problem is that the broker's job is even more important when retailers are buying flour sight unseen. Given that the challenge is systemic, it's fair to say that the market's emphasis on high TAC cannabis has no single culprit. That said, it's also true that there's been a lack of leadership among critical stakeholders, in part because there's little motivation to change. Licensed producers, or LPs, get a better price for more potent flour, Labs are pressured to deliver results, and the entire marketing chain from cultivator to provincial regulator to bud tender builds incentives around potency. Part of the challenge involves the complexity of the product, which has only been legal for a few years, says Cherie Mara, chief commercial officer of Ontario Cannabis Store. The market is still maturing. If you look at the early days after alcohol prohibition, the government was selling bottles and brown bags from behind a counter. The OCS, like other regulatory agencies, markets cannabis according to simple identifiers such as indica, 
sativa, or hybrid, distinctions that are of limited meaning, as well as THC levels. However, this narrow emphasis is likely to change as LPs respond to more sophisticated consumer demand and embrace more complex marketing strategies. In the early days, THC potency was easy to communicate, says Mara. In the future, I would like to see terpene percentages too. For me as a consumer, that's more important than THC. The OCS has a role to play in communicating that by working with industry and partners. In effect, I expect that cannabis will become more like wine, with products known according to factors such as geographical origin and breeder information. It's good news that the OCS, Canada's largest cannabis online retailer and wholesaler of recreational cannabis, wants to provide more detailed information to consumers. However, at present, the market across Canada is held captive to a near obsession with THC levels. And that's hard to break, particularly given the financial incentives. We're absolutely caught in that loop, says Shaw. I've seen some amazing flour that ultimately didn't get picked up due to fear the provinces wouldn't like the THC level. It also isn't helped by less educated consumers trying to get the most bang for their buck. Some micros, and a few independent advocates, are willing to push for a more sophisticated understanding of cannabis, but it's been an uphill battle. The reasons are obvious enough. If LPs, labs, and governments are making money with a simplistic THC-based value model, then there isn't much incentive to change. THC and other compounds can produce different effects based on the strength and dose, as well as the receptivity and tolerance of individual consumers. This speaks to the importance of consistency and of a marketing message that moves past THC levels to include terpenes. Now, on a similar note, as we talk about this story where the high THC is distorting the perspective on the market, it's kind of appropriate to switch to the other story we wanted to talk about today, and that is the folks at Canopy Growth being challenged by Health Canada on consistently 20% or more on all of their products. So this is a story from bnbloomberg.ca. Health Canada is investigating complaints alleging inaccurately labeled potency levels for some products sold by licensed pop producers, including industry leader Canopy Growth Corp. The Smith Falls, Ontario-based cannabis producer was called out by a rival in a complaint submitted to Health Canada's Cannabis Compliance Directorate last month. Might have actually been two months ago, because I think I've been sitting on this story for a bit. According to a copy of the document obtained by BNN Bloomberg, the complaint centers on sales of Canopy's TWD brand that displays a flat 20% tetrahydrocannabinol THC potency for 18 separate batches of its cannabis products. The statistical likelihood of this many lots coming back with identical test result potencies of precisely 20.0% is extremely low, which leads us to believe Canopy is employing a static labeling approach, wrote BC-based Pure Sun Farms in the complaint. Pure Sun Farms is wholly owned by Village Farms International Incorporated. Our conclusion is further supported by conversations with some of our provincial partners, who indicated that certificates and analysis they received from Canopy on these products do not match the potency found on the TWD labels in question. Aside from the price, potency levels are one of the top criteria that Canadian cannabis users consider in their product purchases. As a result, cannabis producers try to grow plants that yield potency levels above 20%, which is believed to be the preferred minimum potency among Canadian marijuana consumers. And as a bit of an aside, I think that in itself is a bit arbitrary. I think just because it crosses a boundary between the teens and the 20s. Canada's licensed producers currently have more than 1 billion grams of cannabis collectively stored in inventory, as they believe it is of an insufficient potency or quality. Executives from several producers, such as Tilray and Sundial Growers Incorporated, have frequently stated low THC potency as a weight on sales resulting in their sizable inventory write-downs or missed revenue opportunities. Cannabis companies are required to label the THC and cannabidiol, CBD content, and potency levels on the packaging for each respective lot or batch. However, Canada's cannabis regulations don't set variable limits for THC or CBD for dried flower products. It does set criteria on how edibles and extracts potency can be labeled. A Health Canada spokesperson told BNN Bloomberg, in an email statement that there's no variability limit for dried cannabis as potency levels vary between different parts of the plant, as well as between plants within a specific lot or batch. All issues and complaints brought to Health Canada's attention are taken seriously, 
including any issues with license holder activities as they relate to the cannabis regulations. If warranted after further investigation, Health Canada would take appropriate action to correct any potential non-compliance, according to a Health Canada spokesperson. When asked to comment on the Health Canada complaint, a spokesperson for Canopy Growth told BNN Bloomberg in an email statement that the company complies with Health Canada's labeling requirements. Flower strains must achieve a defined THC and CBD percentage potency. This percentage dictates how the product will be labeled, both as a brand and strain, the spokesperson said. The percentage is a representative midpoint of a narrow range of historical test results for that product and strain. Only strains that meet the product's specific cannabinoid targets, as tested both in-house and by independent third-party labels, will be sold. So there you go. The discussion still continues about our THC levels, whether or not we should be obsessed with high THC, and whether, in fact, the labels we're seeing with this high THC are, in fact, accurate. (laughs) This industry continues to grow and grow and change and change as it matures. All right, you want to talk about gummies? All right, you want to talk about uh, quick gummies? All right, you want to talk about wanna? Well, this is a good opportunity, Ben. Next is my conversation with Leah Teal. Leah is the marketing director for Indiva, and Indiva is a well-known producer. We've talked about a number of their products, and one of their lines is the Wana line of gummies. And Wana has just recently introduced the Quick Gummy line with the whole concept of they're keeping the THC at Delta 9 in an edible. We'll talk about that and a few other things. We pick up the conversation just after I welcome Leah to the Cannabis Podcast. You are the marketing director for Indiva, and one of the products that we wanted to talk about was the Wana Gummies, and especially the Wana Quick Gummies, which is a new entry into the Canadian market, and we'll get some details from you on that. So how long have you been with Indiva, Leah? Uh, I started with Indiva in June of uh, last year in 2020, and prior to that, I was with Canopy Growth. So you have a a fair amount of uh, history uh, with cannabis companies then? Yeah, I started um, prior to legalization. I was brought in to be uh, the head of marketing for the retail division, for retail marketing specifically. And um, it was just, you know, a wild ride trying to get ready for legalization and (laughs) opening stores across the country and trying to open the first store in Newfoundland and, you know, (laughs) be the first on the map. There was just so many firsts, one after the other, and it was just uh, it was uh, just a, a wild and exciting ride for those two years. Well, that's kind of cool to have a lot of those firsts uh, under your belt. Now we have another one. Yeah, and now you have another one. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so let's dive into that. Now, I have uh, I have given a sample. I um, uh, just to give you a bit of a background, Leah, on the cannabis podcast. I often do what's called cultivar corner where I take a particular cultivar and uh, we literally sample it from opening the jar to having a smoke of it and seeing what the effects are. A little more difficult to do such a review when we're talking about gummies because (laughs) that interim period of waiting for them to take effect could be pretty dead air. (laughs) But I have tried them. But one of my colleagues tried them um, and uh, was very surprised at how quickly it it impacted him. So unlike the, you know might take up to an hour it was like five to 15 minutes now that's his personal experience i haven't been able to try them yet because they're not in ontario yet no that's right that's right i I had heard so where are they now bc and where else they're bc then alberta and then ontario so um, bc's had them for about two weeks or two and a half weeks i would say and ontario they just were listed with the ocs um yesterday and so stores will be ordering them they should be hitting stores you know end of this week into next week so okay excellent i have to tell you all we don't get free samples from the company when they're coming off the, the production <laughs> run so we wait like all of you to get to a store so there's all of us waiting anxiously to get to a store while our colleagues on the west coast have tried them already so. <laughs> already tried them so so let me let me take a step back then leah give me a sense of of what brought you to the cannabis world what is your cannabis heritage how, how did you get here um, well, my heritage isn't that deep into cannabis, to be quite honest. I had a family member who was deep into cannabis, but not myself. And, you know, I tried it and trialed it on and off during the years. And I was really pulled into this because um, I, w- you know, I had a strong background in retail marketing. But as, you know, as I was researching this role, I started to get really, really excited about it. And, you know, part of it was the lure of 
of doing something so revolutionary. And probably all of my colleagues would say it was a, a chance to be at a time when you're making history. And who can say that in their career, right? That's that we're true. Making yeah. history. And then, you know, I, I started this job and there were a lot of OG people there that knew everything about the plant. And I started digging in as deep as I could to learn as much as I could about this plant and started to get as excited about it as they did and started to think about it that that what I could contribute to this business. And it's not always somebody who has 20 years of experience with the plant that, that blazes the trail. There's a lot of us that have come into it later in life and are blazing the trail along with them. So I think part of the beauty of this is that there's people who laid down that those tracks and 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 the precedents so that more more people like myself can come in and push and fight for legalization and uh, take it to the next level and more and more people will join into this as we normalize this plant and make it a part of people's lives so you don't have to have joined 20 years ago you could have joined three years ago and just be as passionate about it as as some other ones so i think that's important to point out and and uh, one of the fun things about being in this business, there's a lot of acceptance and a lot of growth. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and thank you for making that clarification, because, I mean, that is a typical question for me to ask anybody who's a guest on the show. Uh, and it does not always imply, as you indicated in there, that, that your heritage has to be really deep and long because everybody is coming to this from their own special place. So I appreciated that. Yeah, some of us just started the journey more recently than yeah, others. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely. You know, as are, are, are lots of people, um, you know, as as they hit legal age and start uh, dabbling in it that are joining in. So I think that uh, we've moved in the needle very, very quickly. And, and I hope that that things loosen up a little bit in Canada and we take it to another level again. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? We'd, we'd, we'd love to be able to do that. So now let's talk a little bit about Juana. So the, the gummies that, of course, Juana has been an edible maker for a number of years, correct, down the States? Yeah, they've been in the U.S. for uh, over 10 years, um, and they have a really great story down there. It's an all-female-led company, um, and they've really perfected these gummies. Um, And they have quite a few. They have more flavors than we have here. But we launched seven flavors of uh, Wana Sour Gummies in September of 2020. And And what's exciting about it is we have all of their experience to to lean on, um, and These gummies, I mean, honestly, I'll tell you, they're the best tasting gummies. (laughs) I've said before, they taste as good as as regular or better than regular on the shelf gummies. But the the interesting thing about them, I mean, what makes them different is that they come in such a variety of ratios uh, of THC to CBD. And they come in a variety of flavors and they come in a variety of different terpene enhancements. Um, They're all vegan and gluten free as well. So they're just, you know, they're just they're fantastic. I mean, have you tried the, uh, the the classic sour gummies? I have tried the sour gummies. They are delicious. They, they absolutely are. Um, edibles have not been a very big success for me personally. My my um, my body doesn't do edibles really well. I need such a high dosage on them, but but they are really. And I'm tasty. the opposite. I, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the edible lightweight on the team. So like <laughs> I, I have I have the strawberry ten to one, which is ten milligrams of CBD to one of uh, uh, of THC. And I, I I mean I'm very functioning, but I have a great afternoon. I'm just happy <laughs> as a clam. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And 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 you you raised a couple of issues in, in your statement there. The the fact that you are bringing the terpenes along, I think, is really cool as well. Uh, and and that's not only happening in the legacy gummies, but they're also bringing the terpenes along with the quick ones, are they not? That's true. Yeah. So we're going to have a hybrid, a sativa, and an indica in the three new flavors of the Wana Quick gummies. One of them is also a one of them is also a THC CBD one to one. So there's something for me again. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I saw that. That's the uh, st- is it uh, strawberry lime in Canada? I think. Yeah, is strawberry lime. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I get a little confused uh, between the two countries because depending on what you're looking at on the internet, sometimes you'll see the information for the states and sometimes you'll see the information for Canada. And I had to remember, okay, now I'm in Canada, so I had to refer to the Canadian version of these. Which, yeah, I mean, the, the U.S. is much less regulated than we are much, here. And so much. they have different names and they obviously have much higher than 10 milligrams of THC and, uh, you know, some different packaging, et cetera. So we always try to, we always try to have people go to uh, the Indiva.com site where you'll find all the Canadian information or, uh, you know, locally you can search it on your uh, government boards where it's listed. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's give um, the listeners a bit of an ex- uh, a 
explanation of what we've been talking about with these wanna quick gummies. We made some reference to the fact that the the onset of these is much faster than your typical edible where it has to be go through the liver, that transformation of THC that occurs. That's one of the cool features of the technology that Indiva and Wana are bringing to the table here with Wana Quick. Can you give us a bit of an explanation of, of how that works? Yeah. So, um, you know, typically when you consume a cannibal edible, um, it goes through first pass metabolism, which means it goes through your digestive system and the, the original um, Delta 9 THC gets converted into 11 hydroxy THC. Um, it's, it's harder for your body to break down uh, THC. It's a fatty molecule. And so that slower um, process of digestion gives you a different experience than inhaling cannabis, which is a Delta 9 experience and goes you know, pretty quickly directly into your bloodstream. So inhalation versus ingestion are quite different. So what Wana tried to do uh, is find a way to um, kind of deliver an experience that is inspired by the high that you get through inhalation. So how can you have a gummy that's similar to inhaling cannabis? That was kind of like the nut to crack. And so what they ended up doing was partnering with a company named Azuka that makes um, uh, has technology called Time. And that breaks down the molecules into nanoparticles. Then they wrap those, uh, they're encapsulated with basically like a water layer so that they bypass first pass metabolism and go more quickly into your bloodstream. Therefore, replicating the, the inhalation or the smoker's high through an edible. That's the intent, uh, you know, about behind it. And that's the science because your body is 70 percent water and THC is an oil. Right. So, like, you know, like how, that was how they, they cracked it was first it had to be nano, a nanoparticle, but then it had to be encapsulated as well. That's right. Before the bioavailability to get into our bodies. And, and yeah, very, very yeah, cool. Yeah, because, yeah, because, you know, typically you don't you absorb, I don't know, like something like 10 to 15 percent of, right. uh, yeah. of, of it versus, you know, trying to bypass that that digestion stage. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very cool technology. Um, and the the whole idea of having that smoker's high from an edible is, is again, a really unique factor. And I think that's that's what's going to make these uh, a winner on the market. Because I know folks like myself who, who, who prefer the smoker's high simply because I, I, I haven't figured out exactly how much I need to take on an edible to, to get a good high. <laughs> Um, but I have, so uh, I will be, uh, for those listening to the podcast, I'm going to do an official test of the Wanna Quick uh, as one of the Cultivar Corners coming up. But as an aside, I did try them before getting ready for this interview. And, and here's where I made the mistake, Leah. Because of my tolerance, I just took one. And then I waited 15 minutes and I started to feel a bit of a buzz. And I thought, well, okay, no, let, let me take a second one. And of course, it didn't have that effect if I had taken both of them at the same time. And that's going to be my next piece, is just to take the whole package, all 10 milligrams, and see if that gives me that smoker's high that I'm looking for. And, and I will report back on that later. Do you think I'm going to have some success with that? Uh, I mean, I've heard of, uh, I've heard anecdotally of my West Coast friends that have taken two at once and were kind of blown away by, by the experience okay. uh, that do have higher tolerance. But I mean, to each their own, it really affects everybody individually. That's the thing with cannabis. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it really depends on your metabolism and your experience and your tolerance, right? So yeah, um, that's why we always say start start low, go slow. <laughs> start low and go slow. And and another piece that I am adding to that, and, and this is based on, on a guest that I had on the podcast not too long ago. Um, she's a uh, cannabis coach. Um, and not only uh, go low and go slow, but go with intent. Know what the intent of what you're taking is. So are, are you intending to have some, you know, have some relaxation or, or do you want to get a buzz off of it? And, and setting mm. that mind up before you take it also has some impact. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and that's what I like about the options. And I, I think that the three different options are great because you have a sativa, you have an indica, and you have this hybrid one-to-one -one with CBD. Uh, and then now we have options of how long you want the experience to last because some people don't want to commit. To, I don't like to commit to an entire day where I'm like, oh gosh, I've got kids. What do I do? It's a whole <laughs> That's day. right. Yeah. You know, I've, you know, um, you know, I've got to you know, go away for the weekend without, you know, just like whatever with, with just with my husband. And, you know, it's, so it's this whole thing about planning. Whereas 
you have options now where it could be a shorter experience. Yeah, which I think is going to be appealing to a lot of people because for some, that edible experience can be, you know, six, eight hours to, depending on, on their digestion and all of those. So this kind of gives a, a smaller footprint to people's world, as, as you've kind of indicated. Yeah, yeah. And, and it suits different types of occasions too, yeah. right? So, you know, you know, if you have a shorter evening out or, you know, evening with friends versus, you know, like a whole day hanging out at the dock. There's different there's different ways to enjoy this and there's so many different different formulas. You know, in the in the Wana Classic we have one that is very high ratio, the pomegranate blueberry SAE. Yeah, very high. Very high amount of C B D in it to THC. Um, so, you know, that, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, um, cannabinoids in one package it for, is. for the price. It's just, and so it is flying off the shelves. It is super popular. Yeah, that's a very um, popular one so, in our store too. Yeah. So where do you see Wana going from here, Leah? What, what do you think the, the future is for, for Wana in the next uh, year or so? We have a few more innovations that we have in the pipeline that I'm not going to talk about, but I'll just tease you to know that they're coming. Of course. That we're really <laughs> excited about. So as exciting as Wanna sour gummies have been and how excited we are here for, <laughs> for this moment with Wanna Quick. Uh, there's more in the pipeline um, that's going to com- continue to come out and I hope surprise and delight Canadian cannabis consumers. Excellent. Well, we look forward to it. It's, uh, so far, I've been impressed with what I've seen, uh, not only from Wana, but also what's happening with Indiva. Uh, we, we've sampled a couple of the other cultivars from Indiva as well on the cannabis podcast and, and pleased to see that uh, your corporation is contributing well to the legalization of cannabis here. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a, a, a really nice portfolio. We have Bang Chocolates, of course, and we have Artisan Batch Cannabis, which really spotlights uh, local local craft growers and their their products. So, you know, some really great products coming out of the Artisan Batch um, collection. And that one is a, a, a rotating collection of, of different growers and, and their different cultivars, and they're very unique. They're very high quality. Um, so that program really gets me excited. Yeah, I bet it does. And some some exciting things coming to our future. Well, I uh, appreciate you taking some time and, and give us some explanation on that today, Leah. Thank and, you so much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and and this these questions may or not be appropriate because you kind of set it up that your your experience with cannabis is not very deep. And I typically end the uh, any interview that I have with what I call my hot seat questions. So let's just see where they go, <laughs> and, and and you can take okay. it with with the experience level that you have. Um, do you have a, a particular favorite cultivar? Ooh, I kind of like some of the, I like some of the old classic ones. Like I like, um, like a super lemon sour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like some of the diesels, like, uh, like a lemon diesel. I like a sour tangy. <laughs> oh yeah. You got <laughs> lots of, lots of, of good taste there. Lots of old, <laughs> old favorites. Excellent. Uh, do you prefer joints or vape? Uh, I kind of go back and forth. Okay. Um, what if one like one of I don't my kids are going to listen to this I know they're going to but <laughs> <laughs> my guilty pleasure is smoking cigarettes so I kind of like smoking ah, okay. a joint but but I do have I have like a crafty so I kind of like using that versus like yeah, you know vape too. cartridges yeah, yeah. That, that that's my I really like that vaporizer I'm quite happy with with that I just picked up the crafty I've had a number of stores in Bickles over the years do you have a favorite munchie Leah? I, I prefer inhaling to edibles, but I do love I do love the gummies. Are you talking about munchies when I eat? When I'm still yeah, munchies uh, exactly. Once you have imbibed oh, yeah. in some cannabis, oh, do you do okay. well, your favorite munchie? Because <laughs> that question is coming gave, up next. <laughs> one of my friends gave me the perfect term for it. It's like I don't get the munchies; I get the eaties. Like, <laughs> I, I like just, that. It's like I am starving, and I want to go like make something like a meal. So I will go and actually like saute mushrooms in a white wine sauce and, and toss it in linguine. That'll oh, be like my, my snack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming over to your house. <laughs> that sounds delicious. And now to the question that you were you were kind of leaning towards, anyways. Uh, do you prefer edibles or flour? Flour. Flour. There you go. And but this, that's why I'm excited to try these fast acting gummies. <laughs> absolutely, and 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 I am too to to try them in, in with the full fashion and, and see what they do for me. And then the last couple that I have, Leah, are really involving terminology, and I'm fascinated by our country how how broad it is and how the languages can change across our country. And uh, do you have a term that you would use for a running joint, a joint where that's running down the side on you? Uh, 
canoeing. There you go. That's that's the most popular answer to that. White Rabbit is also Canadian. one that came out. It is very Canadian. <laughs> uh, very Canadian. I asked a guest just last week about that. And just as I was about to tell him what it was, he, he jumped on canoe. And then the last one is, do you have a, a term of phrase for what three and a half grams is? And surprisingly enough, it's referred to in a number of different ways across our country. An eighth. There you go. That's typically the answer in B.C. Um, in when we move <laughs> east, we hit Ontario, it becomes a half a quarter. When we go to uh, Quebec, it's referred to as a three and a half. And then three and a half grams, I was told by a guy in New Brunswick, that's what they call it. So I don't understand half a quarter, but... <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> Except those who use it. And it seems to be primarily people who were born in Ontario, and uh, they just grew up calling it a half quarter. So Well, there you go. I was born in Alberta. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today, Leah. I really appreciate it and giving us some more information on Wana and Wana Quick. And we will leave it there. You enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. It's totally my pleasure. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. Well, Go to our corner today, kind of a double treat. I've decided that the smart thing for me to do since... I quite regularly do reviews of various strains and various paraphernalia on the Cannabis Podcast, that I should kind of fall into the habit of every time I open something new, let's just start a cultivar corner. Maybe it'll end up getting onto the show. Maybe it won't. <laughs> but this time, I think this one will. Because we're going back to concentrates this time. And the particular concentrates we're going to do, I'll talk about in just a moment. This is really a twofold in terms of the Cultivar Corner bonus episode, for lack of a better phrase, uh, because we're trying out, again, concentrates, but we're also trying out concentrates in a new vaporizer. I mentioned last episode that I was thinking about a new one and was getting a little tired of my CFX Boundless. The problem that I had with that, it just didn't have a real good airflow. I decided to go back to a name that I know well, having used two volcanoes, uh, gone through two replacement sets of switches on those volcanoes, and having them both eventually just burn out from overuse. <laughs> but still, Stores and Bickle really knows how to build vaporizers. I previously had the Mighty. You heard me talk about the Mighty a whole lot, if you've listened to the podcast at all. And uh, along that regard, I decided to go back to Stores and Bickle. But I didn't want to go to the Mighty because that was just a little too pricey for me. So I went a little bit lower. The Mighty's younger brother. It used to be called the Crafty. Now this version is called the Crafty Plus. And as soon as I put lips to mouthpiece and had a little herb in this, I immediately remembered why Stores and Bickle has such a good reputation for good airflow in vaporizers. You just get a good hit. And then I suddenly remembered that it was also a pretty significant hit when you, because you got that much in, you felt it a little more. So... Here we go. Double bang on this edition of Cultivar Corner. And now let's talk about what we're going to be sampling. I had a visit from the folks behind this company a couple of weeks ago. They dropped into the store with a very cool uh, cr crate, basically like an old apple crate. In fact, they handed me a crowbar and asked me to open it. And inside was a whole bunch of paraphernalia, a bunch of graybeard cannabis shirts, a representation of some of their packaging that they were coming out with. And just a whole bunch of stuff to make you think about Greybeard Cannabis. And lo and behold, the product has now arrived in the store. This is what we're going to be sampling today. And this is Greybeard's Live Resin Terp Slush, affectionately known as Kish. And the Kish is referring to the fact that it is a shishka berry, is the strain behind this. And as they were talking about it, a shishka berry was a strain developed for the resin that it produced. Heavy, heavy resin from Shishka Berry. So needless to say, when they're looking for a live, so flash freeze a live plant, then extract it into a resin terp slush. And if you're using Shishka Berry, you call it Kish, and it's going to be full of terpenes. And not only full of terpenes, but also a fairly significant THC. 74.2% is the THC on this guy. And here's the value that is going to blow your mind. The amount of terpenes. 
percent. That's a heck of a lot of terpenes. <laughs> now, that's a lot of terpenes. But the thing I find really interesting when you look on their website, and I, of course, will have a link to this back at CannabisPodcast.com, they don't actually say the terpenes. <laughs> Bit of an odd bar there. They do have some aromas. There's some uh, pine, probably maybe some pinene. There's some orange, could be some limonene for that citrus element. Mango, perhaps some myrcene. And raspberry leads me to believe there might be some osamine in there. So they're not listening to the terpenes. Those are my best guesses based on the aromas they have. And I think it's time to crack this because I have heard from those who have picked this up that the aroma coming out of this thing fills a room as you open this. So let's try it. Here it is. This is my first crack at live resin terp slush kish from Greybeard Cannabis. Let's have a smell. Oh. Wow. Yeah, that's very terpy, all right. And it's in a, what I would call a, a very honey-like condition. Oh, my, my, my. Sticking my little dab pin in there and a little dab rig. Oh. Not as fragrant as I thought it was going to be at, at the 14.89% of terpenes. I thought this was literally going to fill my room, <laughs> but, it, but it hasn't. However, it's a very pleasant smell. So now the second part of our kind of weird cultivar corner, because I do have the crafty, and it does come uh, with, uh, what do they call it? They call it the uh, concentrate wafer or something like that. Just a little piece of, um, I guess, some steel wool that fits inside the bowl. And the idea is you, of course, put a little dab on top of that and throw up the heat and see where we go. So that's what we're going to try this on first because I really do like the fact that the Crafty has such lovely airflow. And we're going to give it a try for some concentrates. So bringing it up to temperature now, putting the top on my Crafty. And as soon as I get the green lights, I believe we're going to hear a little buzz. Not quite as a loud buzz as the Mighty used to produce. But I think it's still going to give me an indication that it is finally up to heat. You know, see, there was just a little bit of a beep from my Crafty. The light is green. Let's have a taste of this kish. Now, I'm going to have to do a couple of different versions of this because I want to make sure I'm giving it a fair trade or a fair chance. And I just looked inside, and sure enough, that little bit of concentrate is gone. So I guess I'm not convinced yet that I either know how to use the Crafty for <laughs> concentrates or that it is the perfect thing for concentrates. It's certainly great for herb. So I'll tell you what. Just to make sure we give this a fair crack, I'm pulling out my turp pin. And I'm going to dip that turp pin into that live resin turp slush called Kish. And let's get a real good taste of it. Let me just get the turp pin enabled. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's all the flavor. Mmm. Flavor and a pretty quick hit. <laughs> yeah, <and> that's <coughs> still an issue I have with concentrates is the old cough that comes out there. And you probably haven't heard much of that because I tend to edit those out when we go to air with this. That tasted pretty darn good. Let me have another taste of this because it also is feeling pretty good. Let's go for a second hit. And there we go. Is it just me? Or does everyone cough <coughs> when doing concentrates? Whether you're doing them out of a dab rig, a turp pin, or through the crafty, and I think I obviously have realized that I did not put enough into the crafty to really get a good value out of that. But I, <coughs> whoa, aha, I have gotten pretty good value out of the turp pen, though. 
<sighs> wow, that is a really big hit. Like, I mean, a big high. Where is it? It's, it's, it's kind of just there. I don't really have any happy eyes, but there's definitely some cerebral elements to it. And not, not as of this point, and maybe it's a creeper moving into the body, but just a little bit about body relaxation, not a heavy. I was thinking this was going to be more of an indica. <laughs> I've been calling those wrong so much lately. Okay, one more hit of this, and then I'm going to put this away, and, and we're going to call this one a success. And then I just sat here for a while, and I had to turn the microphone back on. I had a goal today, just because, uh, I don't know, the way the day was, and, and the fact that I bought this concentrate, and I had the new crafty and all that stuff. I really wanted to get blasted. Just really wanted to. <laughs> I am so pleased to say that I got there. Whoa. I, I'm really high. This is, this is really good. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed this. And it seems to be building as, as it goes along. A oh, really nice buzz. Mm, mm, mm. I felt I owed it to you to not leave it where we were, even though it, it ended in a rather positive note. But wow, I definitely achieved what I was looking for. Mm. And, and let me throw a little tease at you since I've already added something. The next thing we're going to take a look at on a future episode is another product from the same folks who created this uh, from Greybeard Cannabis, although it's under the brand name of Thrive Cannabis, and that is, see how stoned I am? <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just right into this. <laughs> We're going to be taking a look at, uh, uh, yeah, you can tell how stoned I am, I'm just rambling. Um, Tommy Chong, I follow him on Twitter, and he had mentioned these uh, just a short time ago, the first time he had tried them. And that's one thing we're going to be looking at in a future episode of Cultivar Corner, and that is THC quick strips. Just place them under your tongue and let that 10 milligrams of THC go to work. And so the big test for us is, <laughs> as people who know me joked, so how many do you think it's going to take for you to feel it? <laughs> We will find out, but I digress. Wow. As you can tell, I got really high from that Greybeard Live Resin Terp Slush Kish. Well done, folks. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. All right, this is something that everybody has to deal with at some point. <laughs> and that is how to smoke weed inside without getting caught. Now, of course, I'm assuming that anybody listening to this podcast is 19 years or older. Do not condone anybody under that, either participating or either consuming. Now that I've covered off that, this is a story from Herb.co. How to smoke weed inside without getting caught. Whether you're trying to avoid the wrath of your landlord, hotel smoking regulations, and boy, I've been dealt with those over the years, or your parents' disapproval. This is how to smoke weed inside without getting caught. Now, if you want a foolproof way of smoking weed inside without getting caught, simply invest in a genius pipe. It's not only one of the most premium and durable pipes in the market, it's also designed for stealth with a cover lid that traps any unwanted weed smell and smoke. If you feel like the pipe's too risky, then go ahead and get yourself a vape pen. These devices are not only healthier for you and deliver better highs, but they're also much more effective in controlling weed stench. Now, the best thing you can do is to get a dual-use vape. That's where you can vape your favorite flower and concentrates with the same device. Now, they're recommending the Da Vinci Micro, which is a ultra-portable high-tech device. They also list a couple of others. One is which that I am aware of. These stores in Bickle Crafty for best vapor. Best quality is the Pax 3. And best value is the X-Vape Aria. Now, if you still want to smoke your regular joint inside, there are a few other techniques you may have heard of as well most of which involve using a bong and blowing the smoke out the window. 
and I've heard a number of people do this, blowing the smoke into a towel or through a cardboard tube stuffed with dryer sheets. And I remember in many hotel rooms taking that towel and stuffing it on the door so no air would get out of the room. But not every weed smoker likes or owns a bong. I certainly don't anymore. Moreover, we think there's a classier way to smoke weed inside. Some people call this technique the Jamaican or Hawaiian hot box. All you need to smoke weed at home without getting caught is a shower and a bathroom with a window or vent. Step one, bring your usual shower supplies into the bathroom with you, along with your weed and smoking device. While you can use a bong or a pipe, joint smokers will be glad to know that the shower method works best with a joint because they're small, discreet, and leave no evidence. Step two, cram your towel into the crack beneath your door so that no smoke can leave the bathroom. Step three, turn your shower on full blast so that the water is as hot as possible. If your shower has a door, keep it open. The objective here is to generate as much steam as possible until your bathroom resembles the inside of a steam room. Step four, once your bathroom is sufficiently steamy, it's time to spark your joint, or pipe or bong if you decide to do that. The smoke will convolve with the steam, neutralizing the smell. Once you finish your joint, flush the roach down the toilet. Step five, now it's time to open the bathroom window or turn on the vent, allowing the steam or smoke to billow out of the bathroom. And step six, for extra precaution, hop in the shower quickly to scrub any remaining smell of marijuana off your body. This may seem like overkill, but if you want to smoke weed inside without getting caught, cleanliness is a small price to pay. This will also give time for the steam to exit through the window. Once all of the steam or smoke is cleared, close the window and exit the bathroom victoriously. <laughs> and it's the end of a story like this where I realize how lucky I am and how happy I am to live in a single household that is my household and I can smoke whatever I want in my household and, and outside of my household as well. So for those of you who are suffering, either the apartment you live in does not allow it or you are over 19 and still living at home and you don't want to get hassled by your parents, there's some advice for a couple of ways that may help you to smoke some weed indoors without getting caught. And this seems like an appropriate moment to spark up another doobie, which always helps my memory when it's time to tell a story. And today I'm going back, well, of course, I'm always going back. <laughs> I'm not telling future stories, just in case you haven't figured this out. Okay, and then that gives you an indication that I am feeling pretty good today, too. Uh, I perhaps will do this at some point in the future, but I'll tease you. This is some stuff that uh, is getting me flying today is Bruce Banner, and it is at 31.2% THC, despite everything we have talked about about high THC and it not being the be-all and end-all. It has gotten me pretty high. But I digress. The story I wanted to tell you today was back a, a number of years ago, um, almost 40, 45, 46 years ago. And it's funny as you go through life and you end up where you are, you look back on your life and you realize that you didn't really go a whole lot further afield <laughs> than where you started. The city that I live in now is where we actually came to on our honeymoon when we got married 45, 46 years ago. And it was in this city that we went to a bar on our honeymoon and found some pot because that's how you did it back then. There, there were no cannabis stores. <laughs> cannabis was not legal then. Uh, and I certainly didn't have a dealer here in uh, the city that I knew. So that's what you did. You, you went to a bar and you asked around and luckily we found somebody. And I think I scored what was called a lid back then. And that's probably a between a quarter and a half of an ounce. Uh, again, a lot of leaf, not, not a whole lot of bud, but a lot of leaf. And we did score that lid. And where it became a bit of a problem was we then went to uh, the movies. The, there was a twin theater in the city at that time. I think long since been torn down, as so many movie theaters have. But after scoring some weed and stopping at a local park, rolling up a couple of doobies and getting appropriately imbibed, we went off to see a movie. I can't remember what movie it was. It might actually have been that Mel Brooks movie with the, with the cowboys. The name escapes me right now. Oh, Blazing Saddles. I think it might have actually been Blazing Saddles because I remember laughing my head off during the movie from, and perhaps because we were so stoned. So we went to this movie and 
didn't think anything of going to the movies because why would you? You're just going there to have a good time. And it was until we left the movie afterwards and we're now getting to the car. And I think we had now traveled. We were heading back to the campground where we had, were going to spend the night. And I don't know why, but I asked my wife to, to check to see that she had the weed. <laughs> she didn't. This is when we discovered that the bag of weed and her purse were left sitting on the arm of the chair that she was sitting in in the theater. And we're probably now 20, 25 minutes after this show ended and, and we've gone away. <laughs> hey, when you have somebody who is as much a lover of cannabis as I am, and you are on your honeymoon, and you know that there's a bag of cannabis in a purse that's sitting on a chair back in that movie theater, what are you going to do? You're going to go back and get that bag and, and get it off of that chair because <laughs> your night's going to be ruined if you don't. My wife was a little reluctant. Well, okay, no, she was really reluctant. <laughs> but I convinced her uh, because, well, what were we going to do if we didn't have any weed for, for our honeymoon? So we went back. Um, she made the plea to the to the people at the theater, and as it turned out, nobody was sitting in that in that chair. They went back into it, and lo and behold, her purse was still there. We managed to get the weed that we had scored and, and managed to use it. <laughs> and I think she still holds that against me for forcing her to go back into that theater and, and grab her purse. Because <laughs> she figured again, she was kind of a paranoid, uh, and she figured she was going to get busted as soon as she put her hand on that purse. Nobody got busted. We ended up with the weed. And because of that, we had ourselves a pretty darn good honeymoon. If you ever have any ideas or thoughts on what happens here on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you have any suggestions for interviews or cultivars, those are always welcome as well. And speaking of interviews, on the next episode, we're going to talk to Taser Ray. Taser has created Cannabis Defender, and he's been working with an award-winning grower, Ryan Murray, to develop this product which teaches cannabis plants how to eat bugs. It's a fascinating story, and we'll have that on the next episode. That wraps it up for episode 69 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Cannabis Podcast.